the advantage? Well, I know that in this room are the developers and the businesses that are going to be launching the next hit games that are going to hit you know, the online and the social channels. And in that case, you know that when these games start taking off from a viral perspective, the database is going to be something that's very difficult to keep up with in terms of how that might be bottlenecking either from I.O. or from memory. Uh, and so today we're going to be really focused on database options and scaling your database tier for online and social games. So my name's Reed Maloney. I'm the product manager that covers our gaming solution. And Svetan from Ubisoft is going to be talking about their personal experience scaling the, their, data, their data tier for their online games. So as you probably know, with AWS for your database, you really have three options. And this is really going to be the flow of how we take you through the presentation today, depending on the choice that's right for you. And so we're going to talk about Amazon EC2, we're going to talk about Amazon RDS, and we're going to talk about Amazon DynamoDB. And your choice here is going to be dependent on a few factors. Um, one of the main ones is going to be the technology that is right for your database. And so that is something that you should definitely give thought uh, into before you're actually developing your game and will often dictate whether you could even use, whether Amazon DynamoDB is going to be right for you. If you're running, you know, MySQL, SQL, Oracle, obviously RDS is an option for you. And if you're not on any of those technologies that are right for your game, you're going to be managing it yourself on Amazon EC2. Uh, and so that's actually where we're going to start off. And so for Amazon EC2, you really, for an, from an I.O. perspective, you're going to have this decision point to make starting off. And this is obviously not exact. Uh, this is going to depend on your actual um, uh, random reads and writes and the size of them to say whether it's going to be exactly 25,000 or not. So I'll talk a little bit about EBS first and provisioned IOPS and sort of how you can get to this number. This is for each instance. So if you're really interested in staying with sort of an, an EBS-backed database and there's some reasons why you might want to do that and there's some reasons that uh, it can help you with data durability and with replication. Um, and then if you need to go in excess of that, we also have options on EC2 with our high one instance types where you can get much more significant um, I.O. through each of those instance types. So in this case with provision IOPS, what we're looking at is you're taking an EBS optimized instance. So the one that gives you the most dedicated network through to EBS is the M24XL. Okay, and with an M24XL, you're getting 1,000 megabits per second to EBS. Okay, so that's about 128 megabytes um, that you're going to be able to dedicate to EBS. Within that, you can then take a bunch of different EBS volumes. Every EBS volume, you can provision up to 2,000 IOPS. And when I say IOPS in this case, I'm talking about random reads and writes, okay? And you can then continue to shard them, shard your data set across and stripe across that, those volumes to be able to get up to numbers that could be in this range. But again, you could end up being limited by, let's say, 128 megabits per second, depending on how large those transfers are going to be. So this is a really key decision point if you're going with EC2 is to understand, are you okay with this per instance? Do you want to then, if you need more than that, are you okay sharding your database across multiple instances? Um, and if not, our SSD-backed, they come with two terabyte drives, our SSD-backed high ones may be the right choice for you. So in this case, I'm going to focus on MySQL for EC2. And so if, you are, uh, if you're running in the case where you're just asynchronously writing to your database and you're really running your active data set out of memcache or buffering on the client or buffering in your web servers or, or your app servers is not really a problem, you could really just take your database down for a short period of time, run a command line that says modify it, and spin up a larger type. Okay, and then you're pretty much set. 
if you're really trying to minimize the amount of time due to your game that you're, that you're down, I'm gonna take you through some ways you can do that where you're really just down when you're remapping your DNS, okay? And so we're, we're, we're gonna really just start in a situation where you have a read replica already set up. Um, one of the best practices if you're expecting to scale may be just to set up your read replica to be larger already, understanding that you may just actually fail over yourself to your read replica, and then you're already in a larger instance type that can help you scale through that. If not, one of the first things you're gonna do is actually scale your read replica first. So you wanna take that out, and you're just gonna modify it to a larger instance type, and then you're gonna let it catch up, okay? And catching up is something that obviously you'll need to monitor, monitor with binary logs and make sure you actually have all the data there. Um, and at that point, what you want to do is actually take out the master, remap your DNS, promote your slave to your master, and you've scaled. And then you really, you just want to add that replication back by adding, again, another uh, MySQL slave back. Okay, so that's really doing it yourself with MySQL. Um, and in terms of scaling this way is really the way you're going to be scaling to get larger amounts of memory, larger amounts of CPU for what you need for, to support your game. If you're getting into I.O., we talked about this initially, is you're really just going to continue to stripe across more volumes, more provisioned IOPS volumes, and every time you're adding a volume, you're adding another 2,000 IOPS, as long as you're not already bottlenecked by the amount of throughput you have given to you by EBS, um, by that EBS optimized instance. So in some cases, your instance may actually only support 500 megabits per second. In other cases, it'll support, you know, like an M24 XL support 1,000 megabits per second. Um, and so that's where you, you, you'll just continue to add volumes to continue to increase I.O. on that instance type. So when you've continued to scale up a single instance, um, you're really going to be left at some point where you're at M24 XL, it's not working for you anymore, and you're either going to have to do more with caching, or you're going to have to shard it, or you may be considering a whole technology change, moving from, say, something that's more relational over to something that's more like a NoSQL database. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to bring up um, Svetan, who's going to talk to you about their experience at Ubisoft and sort of how they went through um, this sort of scaling process with MySQL on EC2 and how they ended up uh, with Couchbase. Thank you, Reid. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so, um, as Reid explained, uh, the, when you reach uh, the capacity of a single instance, that's where the, uh, the fun part starts uh, for every uh, project, uh, for every developer, and for every operations team. Uh, so, for us, uh, coming from a, a space where we had the, all the internal hosting uh, done in, uh, with our department, uh, and moving into uh, AWS, we had to uh, start rethinking how we're doing our in, uh, infrastructure and how we're doing our development of applications. Um, so when we received initially the, uh, the project in our department, we had the simple case of uh, the application stack and the database stack uh, directly connected. So for everyone that already did something in the, on, in the online domain knows that that will hit immediately walls in terms of the capacity of what MySQL can provide in terms of concurrency, in terms of uh, 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 write operations. So we did initially uh, pro uh, profile of the data usage and uh, <clears throat> the data type. So we had to identify points where we had more contingency on the read side, so that was the easiest thing that we can offload on the memcaching layer. Consecutively, we had to do a con uh, continuous cycling through, through the profiles so that we can identify uh, problems where we, uh, we can resolve with uh, either buffering or uh, uh, on the memcache layer or uh, uh, putting even more memcache, actually, in more, more data in the memcache. So the main problems with that initial architecture were uh, high concurrency uh, towards the database uh, that uh, as soon as you increase the uh, the data, the user data starts to grow and the concurrency starts to grow, uh, this uh, saturates, uh, increases the, the response time towards queries and this slows down the, the system. Um, you can, as soon as your data set starts to reach the maximum amount of memory that your instance size, 
uh, has, then what, what happens is you start uh, offloading data to, to, uh, to the disk storage system and uh, putting other, the other one that has been pushed back uh, into the memory so that you can operate over it. So the only options here were just to increase the amount of uh, instance sizes so that you can reach certain capacity and maintain certain uh, latency towards uh, your requests. Other issues that we also uh, uh, identified during the increase of the uh, instance sizes was also the, 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 because of the specification, the EBS storage, we were limited to a specific amount of IOs and we, we couldn't go beyond that. So we had to uh, address that, that issue too. Um, the latency, as soon as you increase the data size with which you operate and the concurrency of uh, connections that are heading and operating over that data, uh, the latency of the storage system also increases. So one of the uh, solutions that we uh, decided to take is to push a bit of a caching on the client side. So um, insignificant data that uh, didn't require immediate persistence was stored on the client side and during, uh, during operations that data that was, uh, what with more important, uh, was more important to be written, they were batched together and they were synced into, uh, through the application systems. So we had to uh, resolve the, uh, the capacity of, on the EBS, so we had to stripe data over uh, the EBS volumes. Um, the one of the most significant uh, changes that we had to do is the sharding of the, of the data. Uh, again, through profiling the, the type of data that we have in the system, we're able to identify uh, the specific application data and specific user data that could have been sep could be separated. Uh, we had to denormalize the user data, so we uh, we started acquiring the user data only by primary key uh, types, uh, by primary key. So that also uh, that allowed us to, based on the primary key, to start using a sharding. Uh, or distributing that data, uh, the user data, over multiple MySQL instances. Uh, we continued to cache extensively. We pushed even more the, mem the memcache usage as um, we started using the uh, memcache also as a buffering mechanism so that uh, the other type of data that needs to be written and was not, uh, it was not so important uh, was buffered on the memcache and was synced with the rest of the data when uh, the, the, the next requests were coming. Uh, the application data, uh, we, from the database and the caching layer, we, we pushed it to, to the application layer uh, using the opcode caching on the, on the PHP uh, application service. So what we ended up having was uh, an architecture of this type, that we, had the, we maintained the primary uh, MySQL, uh, MySQL nodes where we had still some, uh, some configuration and application data plus some user statistics. And the rest of the user data we striped over multiple MySQL instances backed by memcache uh, nodes in front of them. The, the good thing was we were able to horizontally scale now the system. The, the bad thing was that the maintenance of that system was becoming more and more complex. And uh, failures of individual, uh, individual memcache nodes were impacting, could have been impacting the, uh, the instances, the MySQL instances for that specific shard. Um, failures uh, of individual instances with the amount of those, we had to uh, write uh, tools to maintain and to operate over those MySQLs so that we can bring, bring those and promote masters and slaves. Uh, upgrades uh, of the system. Um, rebalancing when uh, the system had to grow. This was uh, one of the biggest issues that we had also. Uh, we had to push the, the rebalancing operation uh, towards the application layer. So this was additional overhead of the developers to develop the logic and to maintain that on, um, in the application. So one of the solutions that we had, one of the ideas was to change simply the database uh, uh, management system to try to find a solution that was able to fit in our data access pattern so that it can help us de decrease the amount of uh, overload, uh, overhead that we had on the, on the operation side and, uh, and, uh, and the rebalancing and the growth to address the growth of, the, of our system. But that on the other side was bringing other questions that we had to answer to. Um, we had uh, to build a new knowledge into development and operations teams. We had to address the, uh, the data uh, abstraction in the relational layer. 
the relation uh, be uh, between different components of the system. We had to change the operational process. Uh, the, we had to build the, uh, the, the procedures for the, uh, the cluster expansions, for the uh, monitoring, for the backup and restore process. Uh, the, the other question was uh, the maturity of the technologies that were on the market. Um, it was a new movement and we weren't sure how different, develop, the different technologies will be handling the, the development cycles, the release cycles of, of their product. Uh, and that would have impacted our, um, uh, our project uh, or projects. And we, we had to evaluate uh, properly the, the systems that we were using. So because of this already, uh, uh, the work done already on the, uh, the denormalization of the data and uh, the primary key access or the key value uh, structure of our, of our, uh, of our data, uh, we were able to uh, work around and reuse the, the, the work being done with Memcache. Um, we were able to uh, restructure the data in such a way that from the key value uh, uh, functionality of Memcache, we were able to build the relationship in internal, internally between the different, uh, the different data structures. Um, not having a secondary key lookup was forced, uh, forced us to build um, internal, uh, uh, internal lists with the primary key uh, to which the different, uh, the different uh, date, data types were, the different data was uh, dependent on or had a relation with. And the solution that we were able uh, to, to, to choose and to work with was uh, Couchbase. Uh, because of the, the access pattern that we already had, and the functionality of Couchbase, uh, they, they were providing a uh, memcache uh, compatibility layer. Um, we were able to uh, immediately fit the, um, uh, that technology into our, uh, into our, uh, into our infrastructure. Uh, that provided, uh, uh, we were able to keep with that the, the performance that we already had from memcache. And on the other side, uh, it allowed us easy, easier scalability of, of that layer. Uh, we were able to remove uh, the, the MySQL and the memcaching complexity that we already had. Uh, we, we had, uh, the only thing left was the, the single MySQL instance that was maintaining the, the configuration and the application data, uh, but that was something that we were working on on, uh, on removing consecutively. Uh, we simplified, uh, we already had the, the simplified the data layer, uh, so um, that was, uh, uh, that was uh, working very well for us. Uh, the f facilitation of cluster operations and uh, the, the monitoring of, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the stack was something that was very useful and uh, provided through, through the technology uh, that we chose. Uh, the, the problems that we still had with the, with the specific version was that um, because of that simplified access, we, uh, we had uh, serialization and deserialization issues. Um, we, we were still something that we have to work on. Uh, the secondary key lookup, uh, that was something that uh, we've already built, but we, with the growth of data, you, would, uh, you, you have to deal with big lists of primary keys that uh, you have to maintain uh, through the application layer. Um, this is something that's uh, currently on work uh, to be addressed. Uh, text search, uh, uh, or cluster replication, these are also uh, some things that uh, will be go going to be resolved in, uh, in future releases of the uh, technology. Um, so the, the primary takeaways that we had from, uh, from that experience was that um, the, uh, we have to, you have to know that the limitations of, the, of, your, uh, of your stack, uh, working with the infrastructure as a service, know what, you, uh, know what you're dealing with, uh, the EBS capacity, uh, the instance sizes and their capacity, uh, knowing that the technology, uh, the technological stack in your, behind your application and uh, your choices, um, do not implement technology just like a, uh, a fashion trend. Uh, evaluate, 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 so that you know when you're putting something behind, you, it will do and it will fit your needs. Uh, if somebody chose something, that doesn't mean that it will fit your project needs. Uh, do not cut corners for uh, delivery, um, especially when you have to provide um, functionality, system functionality and stability of the game for uh, features in, in the game. Uh, 
if you don't have the system functionalities, your features will not be present because your service will not be available. And development and operation teams, they're, they're, they're your success for the game. Both teams have to, uh, have to support each other and have to understand each other um, during the development and the operational process. And for that, I will pass again to Rui. Great, thank you. So if MySQL, SQL, or Oracle, and probably MySQL in this case, works for you, um, and if the amount of IOPS um, that we can provide through RDS also works for your application, RDS might be a great choice for you. So we really just talked through a bunch of, uh, a bunch of the steps you'd take to, to scale on EC2. With, with RDS, uh, scaling is really this command line. So in this, in this line, we're basically just scaling from whatever your instance is, let's call it a large, and you're scaling up to an M1 XL. Uh, and by putting apply immediately, it's just going to execute that command right now. So what I'm gonna do is tell you about how we're doing that so you can sort of see what RDS is doing for you. Um, but to you, this is really all you actually have to put into your command line and we'll scale it. So that's one advantage of RDS. The other thing is we're also, we're also handling you know, a bunch of the different a database administrative tasks, so we're doing some backup string patching, we're doing that kind of stuff. So if that works for you, it may be a really good option um, for, what, for what we're going through. So I've heard people ask, like, okay, so what are you guys doing differently from what I'm doing on uh, EC2? Well, it's, it's not that different. Uh, one of the big things, though, is that we do synchronous replication versus when you're using a read replica with MySQL, it's asynchronous. And so, this is the start off. In this case, you can be in, you know, we're really gonna say you have a multi-AZ set up. Again, we still, it's still a master slave, even though it's, uh, async, it's synchronously, um, synchronously written. So what we do is we'll take down the slave, just like we were talking about with EC2. Um, and then what we'll actually do is scale the slave, and then we ensure that it's responding uh, that it's caught up and that it's responding to all the reason rights coming in so that all the rights again are, are being done synchronously. And then what we do just like before is we're gonna remap the DNS. It doesn't happen quite that fast in real life. Um, it will, we do, we are still remapping that. And so we have the same problem that you have. I mean, it's, it's not like uh, you're gonna have zero downtime when we're basically flipping the, we're basically promoting to the new master. But we do that for you, and then we bring up a slave for you. Um, and so all that happens off the command line. And so again, if RDS works for your particular game, it just sort of alleviates the pain of having to go through the process. You just need to understand there's, there's gonna be some time where we're actually remapping the DNS, and so you need to have some sort of buffering layer in between to catch what's going on in the game. So the last one I'll talk about, and then uh, we'll answer some questions, is DynamoDB. Uh, and so scaling DynamoDB mainly looks like this in our management console. Um, the way I'll talk about DynamoDB is, again, it's really fast, right? It's SSD backed, you can get consistent um, millise single millisecond uh, responses for any level of read and write traffic. So of all the different things we talked about scaling, like we do all that for you, and that's why Dynamo is called a fully managed NoSQL database. Okay. So when you go in and you say, uh, you know, I'm getting up to a point where uh, I may need to scale my database, you're going to go into the console and just type it in and you're going to basically hit go, and we're going to start doing all the work in the back end to take your data set and essentially shard it uh, to ensure that you have the compute and memory and networking resources you need to keep that high level of performance available. And so 
Dynamo tends to work really well for these types of applications. It obviously is really simple for the devs, so you guys can actually focus on the game and focus on improving the game or focus actually on the analysis and the analytics that are coming back from your game to improve performance, improve monetization, and some of the other things you might want to do in your game rather than actually focus on your database. And so Dynamo really helps with that as you bring it in. But again, it's sort of what Satan talked about initially, which is when you're deciding on that database technology, you got to make sure that Dynamo is right for you. It's right for your game. And if it is, you have all these benefits of you're really just going in and typing in the throughput you want, and you're going to get consistent performance out of it. Okay. And so with that, uh, we'll, take, we'll take questions that you guys have. And Satan's going to join me up here.